Okay, so I'm here with Ingrid Overshi, who's mm -hmm. visiting uh, ICTP for the Scientific Council meeting. Yes. And I thought it was a good uh, opportunity to chat with her about many things. So maybe we can start about um, your interest in math, how that come about, I mean, your background. I see. Well, uh, the first thing I have to confess is that I have no degree in mathematics. Oh. <laughs> My, That's interesting. <laughs> yes, my my uh, my degree is in theoretical physics, ah. and uh, but in in Belgium where I was educated, you see a lot of mathematics as a physicist, and uh, I did in the the first two years I actually wanted to see whether I could do the double degree, and so I took also the math courses. This would be uh, sort of at undergraduate level, you know? Uh, yeah, at the yeah. undergraduate level, mm -hmm. and then the the. So undergraduate degree was four years, and the first two years I took the, all the math courses as well. And then uh, after that it became too much, because the physics teaching was very heavy. We had the third year in physics was extremely heavy, because, well, we had 13 different courses in physics. Right. And so, uh, uh, but I don't regret uh, having all that physics, because I think it gives me a, a different way of looking at things. And, uh, and then I, I learned a lot of, of higher level mathematics later. Uh, because I was interested, I've always been interested in mathematics because I've always been interested in why things work and figuring out how, but I, uh, physics was also a big interest. So you would say that the physics background suddenly has a lot of had a lot of influence in your later career as a it, mathematician? It, it did, because I, it, it really, uh, I find it much easier to understand physics arguments and physicists than most mathematicians do especially in the US where it's possible to get a math degree without even having taken any physics, which I find mind-boggling. Um, but it also gives me a different way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, I, I, in my research, uh, uh, I'm mostly known for mathematical tools and mathematical approaches to image analysis and signal uh, analysis and signal compression. And so, in that setting, I talk a lot with electric engineers, but having this physics background gives me a different way of looking at them than they do. And, uh, and I find that very useful. And how was uh, your experience uh, going through school and his career years? Um, how well, is it compared to now? And uh, yeah, well, it's always hard to compare because I am comparing. Um, I was in oh my god I was in in uh, elementary school 50 years ago so <laughs> comparing something as half a century ago in uh, in a country that has changed a lot and in which the education system has changed a lot so uh, um, actually I went I had all my elementary and uh, uh, so elementary and then secondary education in all girls schools I see. so uh, because that was the standard thing in Belgium. And so, and I think that may have had an influence too, because uh, many, uh, many, many women feel that as a woman interested in mathematics, they were always the odd one out. People interested in math are always already exceptional, uh, way more than they should be, because math is really interesting to everyone. Uh, but uh, but then to be a woman among them, and so I never had that because uh, I was. Girls anyway. it, uh, 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 so, but this only uh, until, until high school. I mean, and, well, until college. Until I mean, college. Even high school. Even uh, 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 was 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 all mm -hmm. uh, thing. So it was uh, in college. By then, I was really. If if I then encountered the attitude that uh, people thought I couldn't be good in math because I was uh, I was a girl, by then, I mean, I just thought you jerk. I mean, uh, I didn't it didn't impinge on me as the same way. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so I never thought about the fact that because I was a girl, I would be expected to not. I mean, it just never came. So up. the school was very uh, sort of uh, positive behind your interest in math already in yeah. your high school. Well. Yes, yeah. I mean, and, and science in general, and and, uh, and and my 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 father was very much supportive of of uh, interest in the sciences. Actually, I I without my father's influence, I might have gone for math straight away. But he always had wanted to be a, a physicist, really. I mean, he came from... What was his profession? He was an, an engineer, uh, an, a mining engineer. Uh, and he, his parents were very blue-collar. They came from a mining region in Belgium. His father worked in a glass factory, not in, in the mines. But uh, so when, when 
his when, when teachers have told my grandparents that uh, this was a smart boy, they should let him study, and they only knew of two professions where people went to college. I mean, and one was medical doctor, and uh, my father couldn't stand the sight of blood, so that was kind of excluded. And then they knew about engineers, and so I mean, it was never a question. I mean, if he was going to study, he was going to be an engineer. And it's only after he finished his, his studies that he also went to a polytechnic, where everybody became an engineer, mm -hmm. that he realized that there were many more things and that physics would have been really probably his first love. So it must have been very uh, exciting for your father to see you yeah, become and, and a mathematician. Well, uh, for, well, first study physics and a yes. PhD mm -hmm. in physics, and then I s uh, shifted to mathematics. But yeah, he was, uh, he was very... Uh, they were very happy about it. My mother had hoped that I would become an engineer. Uh -huh. She thought a scientist, she said, uh, she says it's, it's only barely better than being an artist. I mean, you won't maybe be able to make a living, she said. Uh, you, you'll have to live in the gutter. <laughs> I mean, literally, she said that. I see. <laughs> so she finds that very funny now, but... Uh, uh -huh. Because I did make a little. Yes, you seem to have done pretty well, <laughs> well I would say. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, as, as well as being a professor of mathematics now at the yeah. Duke University, you were uh, the former chair of the International Mathematical Union. Yes. So, how was that experience? That was a very interesting experience, but it was also very intense. It was very interesting because uh, the National Mathematical Union is mostly known among mathematicians, if it's known at all, as the organization that organizes the Congress every four years. And the Congress has a very high visibility, it gives high awards and things like that. But it has many other roles, and which I found much more uh, challenging then, uh, because organizing the Congress, once you've put together the program committee and a local organizing committee, is something of which the IMU has an oversight role, but it doesn't... Uh, the day-to-day... The day-to-day, the, 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 the day -day day -day and, and it's set up in that way, that the uh, executive committee should not have a, a, a nitty-gritty role in the organizing. I mean, there's a kind of independence between an executive and a, a legislative, and, 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 and the and practical of yeah. actually running it. And know. and and so so the the the, the uh, statutes are made up in such a way that there's independence of the organizing committee and the program committee from the executive committee of the IMU. But so the the, the the executive committee also uh, uh, is very involved in uh, uh, activities of the IMU in developing countries and in uh, a, a good, having a good relationship with the Council on Mathematics Instruction. And, uh, and I thought those were two aspects that are close to my heart and that I really am committed to and that's why I agreed to, to, to serve. I see. As this present, uh, mm -hmm. but it was a four-year commitment. And, uh -huh. So it's, it was really it took uh, quite a bit of your time and energy. Yeah, it it's well and actually it takes time, but also a lot of energy, mm -hmm. especially in the, the last year, which is the, the the Congress year coming up to the and year. Yes, mm -hmm. then then it takes a lot. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I was going to ask you about, I remember you gave a talk uh, here uh, uh, some time ago, uh, possibly for the Ramanujan Prize, uh, uh -huh. and you mentioned an interesting anecdote, because uh, you, you ha your work has to do with uh, images, yes. processing, right? There's something about grass and your husband. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah, so uh, uh, some of the constructs that I, I have built, I mean, so I've, I've built, uh, the work I'm most known for is work on wavelet bases. And uh, those are used in the uh, image compression algorithm uh, JPEG 2000, the standard. Which are actually used. Yeah, but they're used, but they, they're not used in your uh, 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 point and shoot camera. Those use the older standard JPEG. Mm -hmm. But JPEG 2000 was a standard, well, that's now uh, 15 years old, that uh, was meant to go beyond the JPEG standard, and it does. Uh, for instance, it allows uh, uh, compression at bigger factors than the standard JPEG, uh, but with very uh, graceful degradation. Meaning, if you only, I mean, with JPEG, if you go much at much more lower bit rates than what the JPEG normally does, you get 
not very good quality. Yeah, pixelated. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, while, while the degradation is much more gradual with JPEG 2000. Mm -hmm. And it also uh, uh, focuses, it, 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 it has a, a, a multi-resolution feature to it, meaning that where you have sharp edges, it uses uh, uh, building blocks that are very, very small and very local. And where not, it, it uses only very smoother building blocks. And uh, so the, the artifacts in an image, because you always have artifacts if you start compression, look very different from JPEG to JPEG 2000. And that gets to that anecdote. I mean, uh, uh, the JPEG 2000 standard is used for a lot of internet applications, but it's also used uh, in digital cinema, uh, in the standard used in, in the United States and in Europe for digital movies, and it's also used uh, by ESPN for their sports transmissions. And so when we had bought about five years ago a very large television screen when this was not as much, the, 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 uh, when they were not as, 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 as affordable mm -hmm. as, as now, we had bought it for a special reason. I was going to be away from home for several months and I wanted my husband to have something nice to watch his sports. And uh, so while we had this, this screen, and my husband was watching a Premier League uh, a game uh, and I noticed going by the artifacts and I said, oh my god, I said, they're using wavelets, they're using JPEG 2000. And my husband said, yes, yes, he was following the game. He says, how, how do you see that? I said, look here in the grass. He says, who cares about the grass? I mean, <laughs> and of course, that's exactly the point. Nobody cares about the grass. And so that's why you could get away with higher compression. I see. Because nobody would notice. People would notice the players. Right. And, and uh, if, so you could accommodate that in your compression. So to what extent did, did your mathematical work that is now used in these, uh, in, in these uh, artifacts, as you're saying, um, was correlated to the actual application. Uh, what came first and how is well, uh, they it connected? Was, it was, for, I had nothing to do with the standards meeting. Standards meetings are something that's half scientific, half political really, because uh, a standard is first, a call is written out, and then people s submit solutions and they get together and there's a whole jockeying because people like to get some of their intellectual property and, and so on. So I had nothing to do with that, but I had published earlier uh, mathematics uh, uh, on, on wavelets and, and they were very much, my work was very much motivated by applications to image compression mm -hmm. uh, because uh, wavelets had emerged in the 80s as a kind of synthesis from ideas, from computer graphics, from uh, computer vision, from physics, from mathematics, and, and, and so, so there was a whole intellectual mixing that went on and that uh, 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 led to this building of, of, of wavelets. Uh, but if you then wanted to use them for signal analysis, it turned out uh, that you, you had this beautiful algorithm, but in practice you had to truncate because everything was infinite, infinite filters and so on, you had to truncate them and well, then it was not as precise anymore, not as nice anymore and, and everybody kind of seemed to take this in stride, like, I mean, yes, math is beautiful and if you want to really apply it, it's going to get dirty and not as pretty anymore and I've never believe that. I never, I mean, I felt, look, the fact that we want these applications is going to put us some conditions. Let's take those seriously. Let's say we want those conditions. Can we then still build a beautiful framework? So I, I kind of turned the whole thing upside down. And, and it turned out you could. And, but the end construction were functions. I mean, in the end, I built bases of functions, just like the original wavelength bases. Did, but they were not functions for which you had an analytical expression. I mean, so you built them from the algorithm up, mm -hmm. and uh, but you could still you you had all all the rest of the beautiful mathematical structure. So interesting in this in this case the the actual application was the one that yeah. that f sort of showed the way for the a, mathem yes. a different mathematics. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. and uh, and then and then when I wrote out the paper. Although I published it in a, a, a math journal, uh, it was very important to me that they would allow me 
to print the tables of the actual numbers used for the filters because I knew I wanted it to be something that engineers would be able to use and I knew that they would recognize these tables. So I published the tables in the same formats as they found them in their papers because I had seen them there. And so I, I and actually that was a, a good move because that really made a difference. I mean many engineers were not interested in all the the mathematical details that went around it, but they mm -hmm. used the filters and they probably wouldn't have if I'd just indicated how to compute them but not computed no, no, or no, tabulated them. them. So this probably is more uh, gaps between disciplines that we are aware of. Yeah, and, and I think it's because I, I came from a non-traditional background and uh, and I was I have no inhibitions about talking with people in other fields. That, that it was easier for me to make that bridge. Uh -huh. Very nice. And as a final question, um, you know, we are at ICTP, which one of its missions is to help mm -hmm. science in the developing world. But in general, what, what would be your advice to somebody young that is considering uh, going into mathematics and doesn't quite know? Oh, uh, well, mathematics is such an incredible, cool subject, if you think about it, because you you figure things out by thinking. You solve problems by thinking. Now, of course, there's a lot of mathematics that has been developed already, so it's good to learn a lot of mathematics. But it's it's good to to learn and to realize that this mathematics is not something that is just monolithic and given. I mean, yes, it takes people have built it. First of all, we've built it. It's not, I do not believe in this concept of mathematics exists and we just and discover, discover it. Uh -huh. I mean, I think we, we build it. And actually, one reason, uh, the fact that I, I work on, on, on these, these uh, building tools for technological applications has something to do with that because everybody agrees that the wavelengths I constructed are things I constructed. People don't really see those as things that existed floating in the and universe found and I found them. But that's because I, they're used for technological applications. If they had been something for physics, people would have more found that they were found. Now, the reason people think that you just discover them is that you have this incredible feeling of surprise and admiration and wonder when you find something. You say, oh wow, that was there. Mm -hmm. But it feels exactly, I've worked in mathematical physics, I've worked in more pure mathematics. The feeling is always the same. Whether you work on these technological things, or you work on mathematical physics, or you work in the pure The excitement is still the same. It's the excitement and the feeling of wonder is the mm -hmm. same. Mm -hmm. So that feeling is, it's just, we, we judge a lot on how we feel when we see things. And if you think about it, feelings are just a kind of, shortcut that evolution has made up mm -hmm. to give us quick insights and uh, feelings about facts. I mean, I'm not talking about love. Yes, That's yes, a yes. Thing. But, mm -hmm. but uh, I mean, and um, it doesn't mean this. If you have the same feeling after you found, a, uh, after you've solved the mathematical problem, as when you discover uh, a new flower it doesn't mean that both of them are discoveries. It just means that you have the same feeling. I see. And uh, so, but it's still a wonderful feeling. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Ingrid. You're very welcome.